I'm Dorsey McBride. I'm going to be reading for my father's novel, Gully Jimson, by Richard D. McBride. Copyright December 2009. This is the introduction, Child of the Rock. Spring 1971, Gully is 18. The prospect for a good flight becomes hopeful, promise. When lifting above the tarmac, we feel the wheels clunk into place. That is a moment to be savored. But normally the most exciting few seconds in a tail dragger come after lining up on the correct runway when power is cut and the plane drops down to the thump squeak of all tires at once. This announces a successful touchdown and that is when the promise of a good flight truly turns to reality. Gully was making these observations his own experience, of his own experiences, but wondering how many times his father must have experienced the satisfaction of re-establishing gentle contact with the earth. He never heard him say it, but Gully liked to imagine a father with aphorism to the effect that landing is never a ho-hum affair, no matter how many times you've done it. Gully often supplied himself with these little fatherly sayings. It was especially his, this approach to Gibraltar's north front airfield tucked in behind Tariq's Jabal, known amongst the Brits as the Rock, which set his mind running in this vein. A string of memories then drifted easily towards the vivid images of the fur people. Of playing and dickering with snot nose, of grooming three fingers, of so many scrapes and near disasters, and of the poor crumpled one who had fallen. At this moment, the pain of how often he had been so unbearably hungry intruded, while more normally his recollections focused not upon the misery but upon the pleasant relationships with his adopted macaque family. He recalled of how interesting and reliable was the character of each of the fur people versus how shallow and vacillating he had found many of the humans to be. Gully had an unusually sharp memory of early childhood, filled with images of human tot, sometimes in diapers but usually naked, squatting and leaping with the macaques, but now he noticed that these scenes were becoming a bit secondhand. The pictures today were served up rather like a movie of somebody's birthday party. They notably lacked the immediacy which used to bring them to life. What was never distant or secondhand, however, was the memory of his mother's black, bright eyes which stared back at him so dispassionately, so dis unlovingly, when he should ask for something to eat. Like the macaques, he was always hungry. Had they not taught him to forage, he felt he would have starved, but in actuality, probably not. He recalled his mother foraging, too, but she was looking for stubs or a bottle amongst the litter on the living room floor. Gully's strongest memory of his father was a smell. They were together only a few times in his life, and he recalled how he wished his father was there the last morning when Gully quietly maneuvered through the house from the rear door, trying to avoid the black eyes. He need not have worried that time. He found those eyes, but they were totally without glitter, half closed, and a face looking up beyond the ceiling. They were part of an awful expression of something that only she could have seen. Her right leg was fallen from the couch, and a trickle of blood following it part way, then puddling amidst the litter on the carpet before her heart stopped beating. He read that she had died from a massive hemorrhage, diverticular disease of the colon. No one bothered telling him. He had to read it in the pathologist's report years later. Even though he never knew or loved her, the image seemed unbearably sad to him. He offered a Hebraic prayer for her memory. Gully had long realized that his fur people had stronger family ties than he had enjoyed outside the troop. Of course, he was naked while they wore fur, and they were much stronger and more agile than himself. He was self-conscious enough, a human trait, perhaps, to understand that they, too, understood his disabilities as well as, as well as he. But while they occasionally teased him over one failing or another, never did they withhold genuine acceptance. Perhaps they even offered a sort of love. Being so starved for affection, he wanted to believe they had. One thing at which he excelled, and which the macaques clearly appreciated was his inventiveness. Clever as they were, the monkeys were unable to imagine circuitous solutions to problems. For instance, the monkeys were quite good at picking a latch screen when they could ease, easily see it. But if they were confronted by a blind, they could not imagine the same latch being behind it, unseen. Gully had managed to open many treasures for them using his human imagination, and the monkeys offered him status in return. Gully was seven when his mother died, and naturally her death was cause for intervention by the local authorities. But the poor chaplain had quietly been watching Gully's rearing for some time. Indeed, the chaplain and his wife were on the lookout to feed Gully whenever was, he was accessible. 
The situation both the mother and the child had not gone of the situation of the mother and the child had not gone unknown by them. After all, the good priest had baptized Gully over six and a half years before his mother's death. So, as news of the mother's death spread, the priest, actually now the presenter of Holy Cathedral, Holy Trinity Cathedral, told the police of the situation. Constabulary were happy to put Gully into presenter's temporary care, and together the various institutional representatives charged with such responsibilities pondered what to do with this canny child. Everyone knew that an orphanage would be the likely outcome, but it is heartening that all parties struggle to avoid that particular solution.